How does this book begin differently than the others? Doesn't start at number four, Privet Drive. Okay. One through three start at number four, Privet Drive. Number four starts somewhere else. Number five starts at number four, Privet Drive. Number six starts somewhere else. Number seven starts at number four, Privet Drive. Why does she change that? Okay, there is a shift in tone. This book, obviously, one big difference between it and the first three is it's the size of the first three, almost. Okay, first book's not 200 pages. The second book, I think, is just about 200. The third book is maybe a little bit over 200. So I don't think all three of those together are the size of this book. And the next book is this book on steroids. Okay. So, change in tone. What's another reason? What would happen if you pick up this book and, you know, there's Harry again, number four, Privet Drive. You pick up the next book and there's Harry again, number four, Privet Drive. Gets repetitive. Gets repetitive, okay? It's one word for it. Another word is it's formulaic, okay? There's, there, there's a whole bunch of different kinds of literature that's called formula fiction, okay? You can download, man, I wish I could remember what that sheet is called. You can download this, download this sheet, and I can't remember what it's called. It's like a tip sheet or something like that, um, for different kinds of genres from different kinds of publishers about what you need to include if you were going to write, for example, a work of romance fiction, like for a Harlequin romance novel, okay? Little 100, 125 page um, cheesy novel. The, the tip sheet will tell you how many words should be in the entire typescript, okay? It'll tell you how many people should be involved in the love, whatever it is, triangle, quadrangle, you know. Um, it should give you their respective ages. It should, the tip sheet will tell you what kind of occupation the male lover ought to have and what kind of occupation the female lover or lovers or male lover or lovers should have, the kinds of places they go, okay, and the kinds of things they do, right? It will give you all that information. In other words, it's pretty much like most action films, most detective films or novels that you read. Detective novels are entirely formulaic. You know, you pretty much you read one, and then what can you do with every other one? You read one Agatha Christie or one Sherlock Holmes, and what can you more or less do? Now, my colleagues who teach detective fiction will entirely disagree with me, but it's pretty true. Change the names, change the events, because detective fiction is also known by what one word phrase? Mystery. Okay, mystery and... The other one I'm thinking of is several words, but it all becomes a one-word phrase. Who done it? You're trying to figure out who done it. Okay. These start off as formulaic. I mean, the first book is actually kind of a detective novel. Harry has to determine, you know, what the thing was that was hidden in the vault and what is the thing that's hidden at the school. And it becomes slightly different in that he has to protect it. Okay? So. In the first book, it's Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. He's got to save, protect the Philosopher's Stone. Second book, Harry Potter and the Chamber, Chamber of Secrets. He has to discover the Chamber of Secrets, just as he had to discover the Philosopher's Stone. Third book, Harry Potter and the Prisoner of Azkaban. He has to discover who the real Prisoner of Azkaban is, right? Because the real Prisoner of Azkaban is not the person that Uncle Vernon reads about in the newspaper. Right? The guy with the long, straggly hair. Yes, that is Sirius Black, but that's not what Sirius Black really is. Okay? This book, Harry Potter and the Goblet of Fire. Does Harry have to find the Goblet of Fire? Nope, it's right there, right in front of our faces. It really doesn't have anything to do with the Goblet of Fire per se, other than the Goblet of Fire spits his name out and kind of puts him in a hard place for the rest of the year. He's got to do something. Did he sign up to do? Nope. But because his name came out of it, we're told there are magical laws that mean he has to do it. 
You know, think about how, what a screwed up world this is. He didn't put his name in. So why does he have to go through with the process? Okay? This is an aspect of showing we're, we're out of the formula now. She's, she's blowing up the formula. Okay? So where does it begin? If it doesn't begin at number four, perfect drive. Tom Riddle's dad's house, or the Riddle house. I'll be very surprised if I ask it. Um, okay, so the Riddle house, which is where? Name of the little town is kind of, you know, Little Hangleton. Okay? Nerd. Okay, so, so what do we see happen in that first... First chapter that we haven't seen happen in the first three books. People die. It's, people die is, you know, like someone, you know, was 80 years old. A murder. Okay? We see a cold-blooded murder. Frank Bryce, the old guy who's intro we're introduced to, he's what? Today we would call him a what? Okay, other than that. A war hero. Why? Because he fought in the war. I'm going to go off on a little tangent here for just a second. Try not to get too long. We've developed this mentality, okay, that anyone who serves in the military, and especially if they serve in the military and go off to war, that they automatically, therefore, deserve the appellation hero. Didn't used to be that way. In, in order to receive the title hero, you had to do something truly heroic. In other words, going off and, you know, I've got friends who have fought in Afghanistan and such. Going off and fighting in Afghanistan, fighting in Afghanistan, when you join an all-volunteer army is doing what? No? You're doing your duty. Yeah, you're going to work. It's like punching in a clock. A lot more intense than punching in the clock, coming here, lecturing, you know, that kind of stuff. But you're doing what's expected of you. That's not heroic. Heroic is doing what Marcus Luttrell did when you go off with your squad of 18, 20 other guys and you're the only one who lives and you try to bring back their bodies. That's heroic. Or heroic is what Audie Murphy did in World War II, taking out snipers' nests and such or doing what Sergeant Alvin York did in World War I, single-handedly capturing over, I think it is 100 or 200 Germans. It was, 300. was it 300? Single-handedly. Not, that's not counting the ones he picked off. Because okay? he was a great uh, turkey hunter. He'd sit there, he'd make a little turkey nose and just, they'd turn and, and just knock them off one at a time. That's heroic. Because okay? you don't expect that kind of action. Um, you know the, the movie that, oh, what's his name? Spider-Man. Uh, World Hacksaw War II. Ridge. Okay, Hacksaw Ridge. Didn't fire a weapon. Didn't kill anybody. Didn't injure anybody. And yet what he did was truly heroic. Why? None of his men thought he was going to be any good. His commanding officers, junior officers, Grunts, they all thought, this guy's a coward. He will never amount to anything. We'd just soon have him on the other side. And he's the one who saved 77, I think it was. Yeah. Okay. That's heroic. Frank Bryce, in here, we're told, was a hero. Why? He was injured. Well, a lot of people were injured. Right? You want a hero? One just died about two weeks ago from World War II. If you've ever seen Band of Brothers, the character Malarkey just died in Salem, Oregon about two weeks ago. I think he was 95 or 100 or something older and dirty, right? Um, okay, off my soapbox. So, I'm going to skip the Riddle House other than to say why are, what are um, Wormtail and Voldemort debating? Yeah, kind of. I'm going to tuck this. I feel like I'm burning up. Um, 
Explain that a little bit more, John, or somebody else if they can. Yeah, do we know exactly what they're talking about? No. I mean, all we're told is to use the exact language that Wormtail uses. Page 9. Wormtail says, my lord, it makes sense. Laying hands on Harry Potter would be so difficult. What does he mean by laying hands on? He doesn't mean not touching him like Quirrell in the first book. He means grabbing him. Okay, so does he just... Kidnapping him. He means kidnapping Harry Potter. So why in the hell doesn't J.K. Rowling say kidnapping Harry Potter would be so difficult? Which is clearer? Kidnapping Harry Potter or laying hands on Harry Potter. Do you go, you know, go to a movie, go to a Scorsese film and hear a couple of mobsters in New York talking about, you know, we're, we're going to go lay hands on him. Why not? Louder. It's religious language. Laying hands on, in the Christian tradition, refers to something almost completely the opposite of what they're talking about. They talk, that's referring to healing. St. James says in the book of James, somebody is ill, get the elders and deacons together, have them lay hands and pray over that person, and they'll bring healing to them. Are they talking about bringing healing to Harry's poor, troubled soul? No. No. How many of you have read these before? Or have read this before? Okay, so I'm not going to give away the ending. They are talking of a healing of sorts. But it's not Harry's healing, it's somebody else's. That will come as a result of laying hands on Harry. So, Rowling has introduced this religious language. But she's not using it within the normal Christian context. We're going to see the same thing in... It's either book six or book no, it's book seven. We're going to see the same thing in book seven, where we're going to have we're going to hear a discussion. Voldemort's going to be talking with some people, and he's going to talk about once the minister of magic is his word converted to our cause. Okay. You don't use con the language of conversion when somebody switches from Democrat to Republican or Republican to Libertarian or communist to capitalist. You generally say they change their mind. But when they go from one religion or one religious belief to another, you do use the language of conversion. Why? Because that implies everything about the person has changed. It's not merely an idea shift. It's their whole focus in life, their whole purpose in life. And he uses that language about when this person is converted to their way of thinking, all right? I think Rowling, we'll talk about that when we get there. Rowling is doing that for a purpose. Okay, so who actually kills Frank Price? No, it's not Nagini. Isn't it Voldemort? He's, yeah, it's Voldemort. He's dead before Nagini kills him. With the Avada Kedavra curse, it's Avada Kedavra and you're dead. That's it. Eyes wide open, usually you land on the ground, Arms splayed, legs splayed, eyes wide open, and you look like you've seen a ghost. But there's no physical mark. Nothing to indicate why you died. Okay? So Frank Bryce dies. We hear a little bit other stuff that we're not going to talk about. Bertha Jorkins or Jorkins and these other things. And as soon as Frank Bryce kicks the bucket, Harry wakes up because his scar is burning. And he's wondering, why in the world is my scar burning? Right? And we get a description of Harry's room. How old is Harry? He's 14. Okay? And he starts to think about his scar, and he thinks, okay, so what should I do? I know. I'll write to my friends. And so he goes through his mind what it would be like to write Hermione and Ron and hear what they say back. And he imagines Hermione saying, ooh, your scar hurt, this is page 21. That's really serious. Write to Professor Dumbledore, and I'll go look in a book. Because all the answers to life's problems for Hermione come out of a book. Okay? 
So he thinks then, okay, she says write to Dumbledore. Okay, so what am I going to write to Dumbledore? Dear Professor Dumbledore, sorry to bother you, but my scar hurt this morning. You're sincerely Harry Potter. Lame. I mean, just lame. Sounds like an idiot. So he decides, no, I'm not going to do that. Ron, he'll try Ron. What would Ron say? Hmm. But you know who can't be near you, can he? I mean, you'd know, wouldn't you? I mean, he'd be trying to do you in again, wouldn't he? There's Ron, always, you know, looking on the bright side of life. He's out to kill you. He is out to kill Harry. Okay. Voldemort is never not out to kill Harry. He says, I don't know. Let me go ask Dad and see what curse scars normally do. Well, what's the problem with that question? No. How many other people have the curse scar that Harry has? Nobody. That's why he's the boy who lived. Nobody else has been hit with a vada cadavera and lived. Okay. <coughs> so there's not a book you can look it up in. There's not somebody you can go ask about it. And we're frankly, we're not told anywhere else that any other curses. Leave scars. So it's kind of odd that Ron brings this up. I mean, look at the three unforgivable curses that we're going to be introduced to shortly. The Imperius curse, the Cruciatus curse, and the Avada Kedavra curse. Do any of those leave a physical mark? No. That's, I mean, that's the nice thing. If you're, you know, a uh, sick, twisted-minded person like I am, you know, Part of you could easily be full Gestapo. I mean, if you could do a Cruciatus curse, think about this. And no side effects in terms of no physical marks. Torture? Oh, yeah. You can torture to your heart's delight. As long as you don't torture them into insanity, as we will see in book five, and towards the end of here, we'll see somebody like that. So Harry's like, nah, that's not a good idea. I'll write to Sirius. How's he going to write to Sirius? End of book three. I know we didn't talk about it. It was on the lecture I asked you to watch. What happens at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban? The very end. Sirius is his godfather, and what does Sirius do? Does he give him his address? Or we okay, he gives him his address. Yeah, he knows where he lives. He also, before um, everything is kind of screwed up by Snape, Sirius asks Harry to come live with him. Harry's like, yes, you know, how cool is that? Um, but he doesn't get to because of how Snape kind of screws stuff up. But Snape, but excuse me, Sirius does write the Hogsmeade letter, so Harry can go off to Hogsmeade this year. But he knows Sirius can reply. It's not like, you know, Sirius is back in Azkaban or anything. So he writes Sirius. Talks about how things are going there. Dudley's diet isn't going well. Why is Dudley on a diet? How fat is Dudley? <laughs> Couple chins fat. Couple chins fat. I like that. <laughs> we're, we're told he is described as the size of a small killer whale. Excuse me, a baby killer whale. Pretty large child, okay? And yet, between this book and the beginning of the next book, what happens to Dudley? Fills out. Is it that he fills out or the diet works? Because he goes from just being obese to being the Southeast Regional Boxing Champion. Nice. Now, you can't be a boxing champion and be fat. You can be overweight, but you can't be fat. Because to box, you got to be fast. And if you're fat, you're not going to. Just look at old tape of, you know, Ollie and Frazier and those guys when they were old and still trying to. It's not a pretty sight. Okay? So, goes on about all that. And then he says, second to the last paragraph, weird thing happened this morning, though. My car hurt again. Last time that happened, it was because Voldemort was at Hogwarts. I don't reckon he can be anywhere near me now, can he? Well, when did that happen? Was Voldemort anywhere near Hogwarts in the third book? Nope. 
Second book? Yeah. <laughs> the Diary of Tom Riddle. Okay, which contained part of Tom Riddle, Dumbledore suggests. So he met Tom Riddle there. Okay, and we have all the talk about between Harry and, and uh, Tom Riddle. Okay, first book, when does Harry Scar hurt? Remember? Um, well, then, in the, in the final scene, you know, through the trap door, excuse me, the man with two faces, but also when Harry and the others go in the Forbidden Forest for detention, and he stops Draco, and the thing looks up from sucking the blood out of the unicorn, and his head feels like it's going to explode. Why? Because the thing that's looking up is what? Is that Quirrell or is that Voldemort? Voldemort doesn't have a body. Where is Voldemort when he shows himself to Harry? Yeah, he's on the backside of Quirrell's head. So it's Quirrell sucking the blood to feed okay, Voldemort. How does Voldemort eat here? First chapter. What, does, what do we hear him tell Wormtail? It's not milk. It's close. He says it's time for Nagini to be milked. Okay, Snakes don't have breasts. So how do you milk a snake? You get a jar and you stick it up into the venom sacs behind the fangs. And you push down several times until it empties the venom in the sack. That's what Voldemort lives on. Snake now. Seriously badass. Okay, I'm, <laughs> there's just no other way of putting, I can't think of a more polite way of putting that. Okay? Um, so he then sends off his letter, and then he gets one in kind of reply, but not from Sirius. Letter completely covered with stamps from the Weasleys, inviting him off to... Quidditch World Cup. So, how do the Weasleys show up at number four Privet Drive? Flu network using flu powder in the boarded wall up fireplace. Okay. How do the Dursleys expect them to arrive? In the normal way. <laughs> in an automobile. Instead, all of a sudden, there are voices behind the wall. How does Arthur get their voices from behind the wall to in front of the wall? He blows the wall up. Yeah, that's exactly it. He blows the wall out so that Uncle Vernon, in his nice uh, dress suit, we're told, is covered in fine white powder. Okay? So, we see the Weasley boys go get all Harry's stuff, and they get ready to leave. Fred and George drop some sweets on the floor. Everybody's gone but Harry and Mr. Weasley. Harry walks to the fireplace. He looks behind and says, well, bye then. He's getting ready to burrow. They didn't say anything, page 48. Harry moved toward the fire, but just as he reached the edge of the hearth, Mr. Weasley put out a hand and held him back. He was looking at the Dursleys in, ama in amazement. Harry said goodbye to you. Didn't you hear him? Why does he say, didn't you hear him? They don't respond. They don't reply at all. Harry, it doesn't matter. Honestly, I don't care. Just, he's kind of going, Mr. Weasley, please, give it up. Just let me go. <laughs> Why does Harry think that way? Okay. What else? Where is he going for the rest of the summer? to the Weasley's house and to essentially the Super Bowl, a.k.a. World Cup. The biggest sporting event in the Wizarding World. It's actually, well, no, that's more the tri -wizard. We'll talk about that later. Okay? He doesn't have to stay with them. And Mr. Weasley points out, 
you aren't going to see your nephew till next summer. In other words, he won't be home for the Christmas holidays, and he won't be home for what Rowling repeatedly throughout all the novels calls the Easter holidays. Surely you're going to say goodbye. What's he mean by surely? You are going to say goodbye. <laughs> He's saying, we're not leaving until you say goodbye. Why? Well, look at the description of Uncle Vernon. Uncle Vernon's face worked furiously. How does your face work furiously? Without anything coming out. Yeah, I mean, it's like he's being tormented. His face is contorting. Why? The idea of being taught consideration by a man who had just blasted away half his living room wall seemed to be causing him intense suffering. What does that mean, to being taught consideration? What does he mean, what does a narrator mean by consideration? Matters. Yes, it's exactly it. Being taught consideration equals being taught manners or courtesy. Right? This is going to become an element throughout the remaining books. Where Rowling wants to keep bringing up this notion of manners. Courtesy, proper behavior, okay? Because it's something she's teaching her readers. Keep in mind, who's your intended reader of, let's say, this book? Probably not a 10 year old. Yeah. She's probably expecting 10 year olds to get the first book and kind of read them in or age order. All right? Harry says, Vernon says, uh, goodbye then. Harry, see you. He's gone. Okay. Dudley eats the toffee. Mr. Weasley fixes it. And then he leaves and fixes her wall and everything. Question? Is um, his issue with just saying goodbye to Harry, is that kind of just deconstruction of pride on his end? Because he's convinced himself that he's better than a wizard. So the fact that a wizard could teach him something in any capacity. Is um, I don't know about that. I think it's more where Rowling is showing us the kind of people the, the Dursleys are. They pretend to have manners. Okay? Prisoner of Azkaban, perfect example. The very last night Aunt Marge is there. Okay? We get the description of the meal kind of in detail. Aunt Petunia, after they eat the dinner and put away, we are told, several bottles of wine. Okay, how many adults are drinking at this meal? Well, actually, in Kenny drinks at 16. Yeah, but neither of them are 16 in that book. Right? And we're not told... That either Vernon, excuse me, that either Dudley or Harry are drinking. It's actually 18 in England, I think it's 16 in France. Okay? <laughs> but we're told they drink several bottles of wine. Okay, now one is one, a couple is two. What is several? Is three several? Or is that a few? Several is more than a few. So four, five, by three adults. So by the time they finish dinner, what else are we told about both Vernon? In Aunt Marge. Aunt Marge's face is flush. Why? She's hammered. She's hammered. She is plastered. Three sheets to the wind, as it's said. <laughs> Petunia brings out the dessert and tea, and we're told she sits there and drinks her tea like this. She's got to have that little finger out. Why? Because she's a lady. <laughs> she's showing her good manners. Meanwhile... Aunt Marge pushes herself from the way from the table. We're told she pats her enormous tweed stomach and goes, But I do love a good meal. Okay. Now, there are some cultures where belching like that is a good thing to do after eating. England is not one of them. It's major faux pas. So Vernon comes up with the good idea after several bottles of wine, some brandy, Marge? 
Okay? Yeah, some. So, he starts pouring her brandy, and I imagine he probably pours her a fingerful. And she's like, a little bit more than, and she does this to the bottle. She upends it so that it probably goes from one finger to three or four fingers. How strong is brandy? Proof level? Oh, minimum. minimum. If it's, uh, it can be up to 60. The better the brandy, not just because of the higher alcohol, alcohol content, but the really good brandy gets up 65, 70%. Okay? She polishes that down in a single drink. You know, brandy can burn. Okay? And she just, a little more then. She's, okay? These are the manners that the Dursleys have. So, Arthur is going to teach the men. What about the, okay, so let's talk about the Weasleys. What about the Weasleys' manners? Do they show good manners? Do they show good manners among themselves? Think about it. It's a family atmosphere. Okay, they've got a good family. Do the children argue or yell at their parents like Dudley does? No. no. What would happen? Yeah, Mrs. Weasley would beat the snot out of you. Not physically herself. She would charm a broom or something <laughs> to beat the snot out of you. Okay? Or Mr. Weasley would do something. When they sit and eat together, you get this picture of a family that loves each other. For the most part, I mean, yeah, every family has a person of some sort. Okay? Um, but generally, they stick together. The Weasleys, I mean, excuse me, the Dursleys, that doesn't come across. And we do see the Weasleys do things that show they do have kind of an understanding of this. For example, the chapter of the weighing of the wands. What does each champion, what is each champion allowed to have at that ceremony? Members of their family. Okay, Fleur Delacour's parents show up from wherever she lives, somewhere in France, because the name of her school is Beaubaton. Okay. Um, I don't think Crumb's parents show up, but Igor Karkaroff is there. Who does Harry have show up? Cedric's family shows up. Cedric's parents are there. Harry's thinking, damn, I'm going to be there all by myself. And he goes in, and there's Arthur and Molly Weasley showing this, their, their stand-in parents kind of for him. So... They go back to the borough. Fred and George want to know, you know, what happened with their tongue, tongue, toffee, and find out. Um, we hear about Percy and his new job with the Ministry of Magic. What, what was Percy in book two at uh, Hogwarts? He was a prefect. If you remember, when they went to Flourish and Blotts to get their school books, what book was Percy reading? Anybody know? Prefects who gained power in their later careers. Okay? And Fred or George, or might be Ron, makes a comment about, yeah, Percy's really into power. He really wants power. Okay? So now he's got his toe, his foot in the door at the Ministry of Magic, and Percy's going to climb that ladder of success. What is he doing? What is he spending all of his time talking about? International cauldron bottom thickness. You know, because we're getting all these cheap knockoff Chinese import, you know, cauldrons that are not up to snuff. And Percy thinks what about that? I mean, this will be the rise and fall of the Wizarding Empire, as the cauldron bottoms aren't the right thickness. Okay? How does he talk about his boss? Like he's God. He worships Barty Crouch. Okay? Does Barty Crouch know who Percy is? He calls him Weatherby and a whole bunch of other names. Has no clue. Okay? That's where we're introduced to Fred, uh, excuse me, to Bill and Charlie. And then we get the Porky. They're going to make their way off to 
the Quidditch World Cup, but they can't apparate because Fred and George aren't yet old enough to apparate. So obviously then Harry, Ginny, Ron, etc. aren't either. So they have to go to Cattery St. Otpole, um, something like that. And they meet Cedric Diggory and his father. Pick up with 71. Um, Ottery St. Catchpole, not Catchpole St. Ottery. Uh, page 71. They meet Cedric and such. And Cedric realizes this is Harry Potter. Merlin's beard! Harry? Harry Potter? Oh, yeah. Sed's talked about you, of course. Told us all about playing against you last year. I said to him, I said, Sed, that'll be something to tell your grandchildren that will. You beat Harry Potter. Fred and George are just scowling. They just want to, you know, beat up Cedric. Harry fell off his broom, Dad. Cedric muttered. I told you, it was an accident. What is Cedric trying to do there? Modesty. He's showing his modesty, right? Yes, but you didn't fall off, did you? Says Amos. Always modest, I said. Always the gentleman, but the best man won. Why did Harry fall off his broom again? Because he had a hundred dementors looking up at him. Okay? And as Lupin tells him, Harry has more in his past okay, that allow the dementors to have that effect on him than most other people. What's the worst thing in the world from what we know, Cedric might have to deal with. Bad test grade, bad, test grade, bad hair day, you know, because he's Mr. Handsome and all that kind of stuff. All right. I'm sure Harry would say the same, wouldn't you, eh? One falls off his broom, one stays on. You don't need to be a genius to tell which one's the better flyer. Well, you don't need to be a genius, because what are we going to see in the first Triwizard task? We're going to hear Ludo Bagman say, Look at that, will you? My God, he can fly. Right? And that's after Ludo talks about Crumb in the Quidditch World Cup, in the next chapter, I think it is, doing the Ronsky feint. Right? It's like, that's nothing for Harry. But what were we told first book? Harry jumps on that broom, and he's a natural. He was born to do this. And we're actually going to see later on in a much later book, Harry flying on a toy room when he's just a year old. It only goes about two feet off the ground and goes pretty slow, but showing us that as a baby, he can already do that. Right? So they go off to the Quidditch World Cup. We meet, we see the chapter of Bagman and Crouch. We get introduced to both Ludo Bagman and Barty Crouch. Um, and then the chapter of the Quidditch World Cup. Right? And we meet Winky. Who's Winky? Barty Crouch's household. Why does Harry think Winky is Dobby? Yeah, they look identical. Okay. What does Winky tell Harry about Dobby? That what he did was not a favor to him. Yeah, he says, you know, you shouldn't have freed Dobby. I, you know, he's got ideas going to his head. Harry's like, what? what what's, what's wrong? What does Winky say about Dobby? He wants, he wants to be paid. Okay. Well, that in Winky sacking in a few pages is going to lead Hermione to come up with spew. Society for the Protection of um, Elvish, Elfish war, uh, Welfare. Exactly. Society for the Protection of Elfish uh, Welfare. Okay. And what does Hermione propose in Spew? They should have pay. They should have sick leave. Do house elves get sick naturally? They should have holidays. They should have essentially insurance, life insurance. Really? What? We'll talk about that more when we get to it. So, why is Winky there? Holding a seat for Barty Crouch. 
And then we see fudge and we see the Malfoys show up. Top box seats. Okay. And we get this description, the bottom of 100 and top of 101. Harry and Draco Malfoy had been enemies ever since their very first journey to Hogwarts. A pale boy with a pointed face and white blonde hair, Draco greatly resembled his father. His mother was blonde too, tall, slim. She would have been nice looking if she hadn't been wearing a look that suggested there was a nasty smell under her nose. In other words, she always looks this way, we're told. Okay? She always walks around like her face is pinched. And we get her name. So Lucius Malfoy, Draco Malfoy, and Narcissa. You don't want to be a Malfoy just because of the names. And so we see the interaction between Arthur Weasley and Lucius Malfoy. It's the first interaction we've seen since the second book. That one did not go off so well. Good Lord, Arthur. What did you have to sell to get top seats in the bo top box? To get seats in the top box. Surely your house wouldn't have fetched this much. And what does Fudge do? Does Fudge say, no, no, Lucius, let, don't start something. He says, Lucius is here, why? Donated a, donated a bunch of money to a hospital. He's here as my guest. Why does Rowling include that little tidbit? Show that fudge is what? Okay, it, I mean, is she saying that the whole system is corrupt? I think that's close. <laughs> I think she is definitely saying there is corruption here. This is a pay-to-play system. It's corruptible. Yeah, and it's well, it's corruptible. You give donations, and what happens? You get perks. You get preferential treatment. Okay. So we see the actual Quidditch World Cup, which I'm going to skip entirely. And they go back to their tent that night, page 118. Harry's about to fall asleep, or he might have fallen asleep. He's not quite sure. And Mr. Weasley wakes them all up, tells them, get out of the tent. And they head off towards the forest. And as they do, they see, page 119, a crowd of wizards, tightly packed, moving together with wands, pointing straight upward, marching slowly across the field. Harry squinted. They didn't seem to have faces. Then he realized they were in masks. High above them, floating along in midair, four struggling featured figures were being contorted, as though they were puppets. Okay. More figures, more wizards, Join the marching group. And then Harry realizes, as he keeps looking at the four figures up in the air, they get illuminated. And Harry realizes that's the Roberts family, the Muggle family that owns the land that the campsite is on. The other three looked as though they might be his wife and children. One of the marchers flipped Mrs. Roberts upside down with his wand. Her nightdress fell down to reveal voluminous drawers, and she struggled to cover herself up. Run. That's sick. So, Harry, Ron, Hermione go off to the forest. They run into Malfoy, uh, Draco Malfoy, who kind of threatens Hermione. Okay. They run into Ludo Bagman, and... We see the dark market conjured, and after the dark market's conjured, Harry hears the, as all these wizards start to apparate around them. And notice, it's Harry that says, duck. Ron and Hermione are just standing there. Okay. He doesn't only yell duck, though. He pulls the other two down. Just like in the first book, he throws his hand out to protect Draco. Okay. If you want somebody to cheat from, to do well on a test, Hermione's your girl. If you want somebody to stand by you in a dangerous situation in life, Harry's your man. 
Here is the person you want in sticky situations that require quick thought and action. Hermione is the one you want by you when you want somebody to think through a situation. Ron, if there's a game of chess, you know, you want Ron with you. Pretty much other than that, right? So we hear all the discussion about the dark mark. Amos Diggory kind of suggests, you know, well, the, we, the house elf belonged to Barty Crouch. Maybe. And Barty's like, are you suggesting I taught my house elf how to do the dark mark? You should know. Everybody here should know. The kinds of thing I've done in the past. And we, as readers, upon reading it the first time, we don't have a clue what he's talking about. Right? We find out later what he's talking about, we, but we don't know at this point. But what does Barty say? He says there's two people in this clearing who definitely would be the ones not to conjure that mark. There's one, Harry Potter, and I'm the other. Notice what that means, by the way, from Barty Crouch's perspective. Yeah, every one of you guys could be a suspect. Arthur Weasley, etc. Okay. So, Barty immediately sacks Winky, fires him right then, her, it, whatever, right then and there. What does it do to Winky? All right, what else? What is a house elf's purpose in life? Who? It's master. Okay. It's referred to as the house elf's enslavement. All right? That's why Winky says, Harry didn't do such a good thing by freeing Dobby. Yes? Were they house elves created by wizards or were they just already magical creatures? Already magical creatures who are at some point subjugated by wizards. Right? Gets me to another question. Winky tells Harry about what Dobby is doing and thinking and everything. How does Winky know? Okay, so does like Dobby come over and you know spend the afternoons at the Crouch house? Does, does Dobby go visit other house elves? Writes letters. Never explained. We are told repeatedly from here on out, house elf magic is not wizarding magic. Right? Wizards can't control house elf magic. What do we see happen at the end of book two? The sock. Master gave me a sock. Master will not hurt Harry Potter. Okay, And he blasts the Lucius down the stairs. We're going to see in book seven... Okay. An awful lot about house elf magic and how Voldemort doesn't understand it and such. Okay, so they go back to their tent. And let's see here. They go back to the tent. And Percy says, you know, Barty Crouch was right in sacking Winky, and Hermione's, you know, just wants to punch him. And Ron asks, page 142, about the dark mark. What, what does the dark mark look like? The skull, with the, the skull with the snake coming out of the mouth. And it's green. Okay? You say, more more, And it conjures up. So Ron says, um, but I don't get it. I mean, it's just a shape in the sky. It's like Ron saying, you know, big deal. It's just a symbol, you know, like this. Or, get all political, like this, you know, on the whole stars there. It's just a symbol, just a piece of fabric. It doesn't mean anything. But it does, right? What does the symbol of the dark mark mean? Why is the symbol powerful? It was only conjured in the past when somebody was killed. So what should they be doing? <laughs> Looking for a body. Because in the past you saw a dark mark and there's a body somewhere. So they know 
This is a different kind of dark mark. They don't know why it was conjured. See, the difference is that we kind of think a symbol is something that just stands in for, represents, it points us to something. This is showing no. The symbol is directly tied to the thing it represents, like this. Directly tied to the event on the cross, so to speak. Okay? This is different than this. Symbol, diabol, or diabolic, or diabolical. The sim here means with. The ball is like idea or thing. It's tied to it. This, if something is diabolical, what do we mean usually by diabolical? It's evil. Why? Because it rips apart the idea thing from its kind of its its incarnation, its manifestness. Okay? So that's that's what evil is. It's destructive. It tears apart. This is why the symbol is so powerful. Right? So Mr. Weasley says. You know whose followers sent the dark mark into the air whenever they killed. The terror it inspired. You have no idea. You're too young. We're going to hear that repeatedly in this novel. Until finally, they're going to talk to Sirius, and Sirius is going to, and they're going to say, try us, why don't you? And he's going to say, okay. Okay, you want me to pretend? You want me to act like you're old enough to hear this? All right. Here's the pure, unvarnished truth. And he deals with them as... Near adults. They're not quite adult. Okay? But after the events Harry's been through in the first three books, you kind of assume people would start to think, okay, this kid can handle it. So, Bill says, well, whoever conjured it tonight, it scared the Death Eaters away. Harry, Death Eaters. What are Death Eaters? It's what you know whose supporters called themselves. I think we saw what's left of them tonight. The ones who managed to keep out of Azkaban, Mr. Weasley. We can't prove it was them, Bill. Probably was. Run, Chad. You know Malfoy's dad was out there. Right? Harry, but what were Voldemort's supporters? Notice he doesn't remember not to say the name. Everybody flinched. Sorry. What, what were they doing? I mean, what, what was the point of levitating muggles? Mr. Weasley, Harry, that's their idea of fun. Half the muggle killings, back when you know who was in power, were done for fun. Okay, so what kind of sick, twisted bastard do you have to be to do this? That's exactly what you have to be, a sick, twisted bastard. You got to be the kind of peop people, you know, I've got friends in a variety of places on Facebook who, you know, Post things about the cruelty people do to other people, other animals, you know, dogs rescued with the ears cut off or their tails and toes cut off. I mean, just weird, sick, twisted things, right? That kind of stuff. Are there people like that? Uh, hello? <laughs> yes, there are. <laughs> yeah, they dehumanize muggles, okay? He says, I suppose they had a few drinks tonight. Couldn't resist reminding us that lots of them are still at large. Nice little reunion. Ron. Okay, but if they were Death Eaters, notice Harry and Ron are not asking stupid, childish questions. They're asking very probing questions. If they were Death Eaters, why'd they disapparate when they saw the Dark Mark? I mean, wouldn't they have been pleased to see it? Bill, use your brains, Ron. If they were Death Eaters, they worked hard to keep out of Azkaban. When you know who lost power, told all sorts of lies about him, torturing them to kill and torture people. I bet they'd be even more frightened than the rest of us to see him come back. That is, the real Death Eaters wouldn't go out marching in force. <laughs> the real Death Eaters are the ones who are, who were never known to be Death Eaters, who were just biding their time for him to come back. It's one way of looking. They denied they'd ever been involved with him when he lost his power. He goes, what do you think Voldemort's going to say if he comes back? 
to all these people who swore up and down they weren't followers. Hermione, so whoever conjured the dark mark, were they doing it to show support for the dead eaters or to scare them away? Mr. Weasley, your guess is as good as ours, Hermione. But it was the death eaters whoever only knew how to conjure it. So it had to be a death eater that conjured it. So we get the next chapter, Mayhem at the Ministry. Well, what's the mayhem? What's the problem at the ministry? Or at least what's the problem at the ministry according to Percy? What did Arthur Weasley do at the Quidditch World Cup? He spoke he to a reporter. He spoke to a reporter. Every other summer when I get ready to go teach my course in London. We have these various preparation meetings, which I've done this course a dozen times. I don't need to go to these meetings, but anyways. And one of the things that's always said at these meetings is, if there's an event in London, don't speak to the press. You know, if there's a bombing, if some idiot runs a bunch of people down in a car, if a couple of crazies go running around, shaking knives, stabbing people, yelling foreign phrases. Don't talk to the press. Let us talk to the press. If anything has anything to do with our students, just clam up and say, call the CCSA head office. Because they'll answer all your questions. Okay? Don't say anything. It's kind of the opposite of the Trump administration, which is, get on Twitter, you know. Let everybody know. Personally, I think Trump using Twitter is a smart move. So, Percy blames his father. How does that put Percy with the rest of the family? Uh, not yeah, Mrs. Weasley, don't you blame your father. What's that showing us, however? Okay, it's showing lack of respect. Who does Percy show respect for? People in power. The ministry, we're already seeing the, the dividing lines in the family of what, what you, you know, hold to. Percy is going to stand with the ministry of magic. All the other members of the family stand with the family. Okay? So, Mr. Weasley gets ready to go to work, and Harry looks at the grandfather clock, page 151, that stands in the corner. We're told Harry always liked this clock. It's a strange clock. Has nine hands. Why? One for each member of the family. But rather than having the hours of the day, it's got locations. I don't know. I think this clock would be kind of unnerving. Home, school, work, that's all fine. Traveling, okay, that's fine. Lost? Do you really want lost put on a clock as to where you could possibly be? Hospital? That's not very good. Prison? Mortal peril, you know, doing drugs, you know, <laughs> making an American clock. <laughs> Mrs. Weasley, 152. Your father hasn't had to go into the office on weekends since the days of you know who. What are we being told? Mm. So Mars is know. bright tonight. Exactly. War is coming. As we will see, very last chapter in here is titled, The Beginning. But even then, it's not the beginning. Because <laughs> then we pick up with book five, and it's kind of like, um, we're, we're back before the beginning. And we have another new beginning. War begins at the end of book five. Okay? So, Percy says... Um, well, Father feels he's got to, I guess I'm not that excited. Father feels he's got to make up for his mistake at the match, doesn't he? If truth be told, he was a tad unwise to make a public statement. Don't you dare blame your father for what that wretched Skeeter woman wrote. Have we been introduced to Rita Skeeter yet? 
No, but we're about to. She's quite a piece of work. If Dad had said, if Dad hadn't said anything, said Bill, old Rita would just have said it was disgraceful that nobody from the ministry had commented. Right? So we get our first kind of introduction to what Rowling thinks of, possibly, journalism or journalists. What does Rita Skeeter write for? Daily Prophet. Right? It's this prophet. It's not this one. This would be the Wizarding Wall Street Journal. This is the Wizarding New York Times. Right? Or Washington Post, or Chicago Tribune, or pick whatever rag you want. So what does Bill mean? Exactly. Even if Dad hadn't said anything, she would have turned the silence of the ministry against them. Now, it seems to me, Rowling is saying something there about journalists. <laughs> yeah. In 2000. Okay. Rita Skeeter, Rita Skeeter never makes anyone look good. Except herself both physically and in her, you know, articles. Remember, she interviewed all the Gringotts Charbreakers once, and she called me a long-haired pillock. Well, it is a bit long here, as the says, right? And we're going to see Rita involved with Harry. We're going to see her interview Harry and how she takes Harry's words and what they become on paper and such. So, let's go aboard... <coughs> the Hogwarts Express. We hear about we hear from Amos and Mr. Weasley about Mad-Eye Moody. Pages 159 and following. So, Arthur's going to go off and kind of try to resolve the situation. Um... Page 161. Bill says, did someone say mad -Eye? What's he up to now? Mrs. Weasley. He says someone tried to break into his house last night. George. mad -Eye Moody. Isn't he that nutter? Your father thinks very highly of him. Yeah, well, Dad collects plugs, doesn't he? <laughs> plugs. Outlets. Okay. What is Arthur's job at the Ministry of Magic? Misuse of muggle artifacts. He would love, you know, anything that's muggle. Out there. Um, yeah, well, Dad collects bird uh, plugs, doesn't he? Birds of a feather. Moody was a great wizard in his time. He's an old friend of Dumbledore, says Charlie. Fred, Dumbledore's not what you'd call normal, though, is he? I mean, I know he's a genius and everything. And that's it. Because he's a genius, Dumbledore's not held to the same standard as everybody else. Okay? Harry, who is he? He's been hearing the name. Who is he? Retired. Used to work at the ministry. Met him once when Dad took me in to work with him. He was an Auror. One of the best. Dark wizard catcher. Half the cells in Azkaban are full because of him. He made himself loads of enemies. And he's getting paranoid in his old age. Sees dark wizards everywhere. Right? So, Charlie hints that he might be seeing Fred and George and uh, Ron, Harry, Ginny, earlier than Christmas break. And they're like, what? Page 164-65. Well, 165. They get into their compartment on the train, Harry, Ron, and Jenny's off with friends. Bill and uh, Fred and George are off with their friends. They're not going to hang around with the nerds because Fred and George are too cool. And we hear, page 165, Hermione hears a familiar drawling voice. Malfoy's in the compartment next door. 
father actually considered sending me to Durmstrang rather than the Hogwarts, you know. He knows the headmaster, you see. Well, you know his opinion of Dumbledore. The man's such a mudblood lover. And Durmstrang doesn't admit that sort of riffraff. But Mother didn't like the idea of me going to school so far away. Father says Durmstrang takes a far more sensible line than Hogwarts about the dark arts. Durmstrang students actually learn them, not just the defense rubbish. So, Lucius Malfoy wanted Draco to go to Durmstrang, which is where? It's in Bulgaria. It's the school that Crum goes to. Crum flies, well, we assume it's in Bulgaria. Crum flies for the Bulgarian national team in <coughs> in um, Quidditch. The term Durmstrang, however, comes from a 19th century movement in Germanic slash European literature called Sturm und Drang, which means storm in stress. Right? There's also some of it in English literature. Great novel, 19th century novel about Heathcliff and Catherine uh, Wuthering Heights, thank you. Uh, Wuthering Heights, where you put a couple characters or put some characters in a very stressful situation, kind of like a pressure cooker. Turn up the heat and see what happens. Okay? Notice she takes the name of the school from this movement. The idea is, this is what Durmstrang is like on the students. You throw them all in, it's not like, you know, people think, oh, Harvard, Yale, Princeton, oh, those must be really hard. No, they're not. You know the average grade for Harvard? Average. It's A. A. It's not because everybody is quote-unquote A level. It's because they have for so long entertained such grade inflation, nobody is given, given, not received, given a grade less than A. And if a student gets an A minus, all they have to do is go talk to their professor or go talk to the chair of the department. And the chair of the department will gently talk to the professor and encourage that professor to change that grade from an A minus to an A. Why? Because in 20 years, that student is going to be what? An alumnus of Harvard making a bazillion bucks and hopefully a major donor. Okay. Talk about corruption. <laughs> so this is Durmstrang. What's the other school we're going to be introduced to? Beau Baton. What does this mean? Beautiful batons. Beautiful sticks is what it means. Wands. Beautiful wands. Okay? Yeah. Rich girls from France for the most part. Okay? So what else are we told there about Draco? Notice, <coughs> Daddy wants me to go off here. This would be like what in the United States? What kind of? VMI, Virginia Military Institute, or the Citadel. What kind of kids get sent to? Troublesome. <laughs> Troublesome. Trump went to a military school. Okay? His father wanted to whip him into shape, so to speak. Okay? Um, doesn't always work, okay? but it's worth some. Used to be. Uh, they used to be all male schools where some parents would send their sons to teach them to become a man. It's either that or the real military. And for most of these military schools, you graduate from there and you graduate with a commission and you go straight into the military. It's not the same as West Point or Annapolis or, you know, one of those, but it's close. Okay? So, Bobaton, beautiful ones, and did this. Um, Back at Malfoy. Why did Lucius want him to go here? Actually, he actually learned the dark arts. But he didn't go there. He went to Hogwarts instead. Why? 
Keep going. So what is he? He's a mama's boy. That's exactly what he is. Okay? And it's pretty clear. Um... Prisoner of Azkaban opens, and Harry tries using flu powder to get to Diagon Alley. And where does he end up? Nocturne Alley. Okay? Notice the pun on phrases there. Isn't it spelled this way? Nocturne Alley, or nocturnally, okay? Which, if you spell it that way, it's pretty clear. Okay? But it's also knock turn, like a turn of hard knocks. Okay? And what does he witness? Actually, Lucius is trying to all close the mock objects to the In Draco? Who did? Can I have this? Who did? Can I have this? Who did? Okay. We've already seen Draco, you know, talking about berating his father and begging him for this and that. Um, okay, so let's skip a bunch. They get on to school, or get to school, and we get the 174-75. They have a new defense against the dark arts teacher. But he's not there. We see all the teachers. All right. Page 175. Harry looks at the table. There's Flitwick sitting on cushions. There's Sprout. There's Professor Sinistra of the astronomy department. On the other side is Snape. All right. There's McGonagall. There's Dumbledore. And then the Sorting Hat sings a new song. 176 and 77. A thousand years or more ago, when I was newly sown, there lived four wizards of renown whose names are still well known. Bold Gryffindor from Wild Moor, Fair Ravenclaw from Glen, Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, Shrewd Slytherin from Finn. So notice, each house leader has some kind of adjective applied to them, and then also we learn of the kind of topography, or the kind of Geographical location that they lived in. Bold Gryffindor from Wildmoor, that is Highlands of Scotland, probably. Fair Ravenclaw from Glen, Valley Dweller. Sweet Hufflepuff from Valley Broad, that is, a Glen is a deep valley surrounded by steep mountains, but a broad valley is a broad open place. And then Shrewd Slytherin from Finn. What's a fin? A swamp. Okay, so Slytherin is a swamp dweller. They shared a wish, a hope, a dream. They hatched a daring plan to educate young sorcerers. Thus, Hogwarts school began. So, a thousand years or so ago, these four witches and wizards came up with an idea to teach young sorcerers. Now, each of these four founders formed their own house. For each did value different virtues in the ones they had to teach. Notice, the sorting hat says the things that each of the house celebrates are virtues. Okay? So we have bold, I'm just going to go with initials, bold Gryffindor. By Gryffindor, the bravest. So bravery is the virtue. Right. Um, for fair Ravenclaw, what? For fair Ravenclaw, the cleverest would always be best. So bravest, cleverest. For Hufflepuff, sweet Hufflepuff. Hard workers were most worthy of admission. <coughs> All right? 
And then for shrewd, Slytherin, power, notice this time Slytherin gets an adjective, whereas none of the others did. And we're told power hungry Slytherin loved those of great ambition. Okay, so let's take this off. Just say brave, clever, ambition. Notice the difference? One of those doesn't match the other three. This is kind of an idea or a virtue, if you want. This is an idea or a virtue. This is an idea. What is this? This is an action. This is doing. Yeah, ambition has to be acted out. Cleverness has to be demonstrated. Okay? Bravery has to be shown. This, this is just hard work. This is just sheer toil. It doesn't have to be good hard work or bad hard work. It's just industriousness. Okay? So, while still alive, they did divide their favorites from the throng. What does that mean? Okay. Do you mean like teacher's pet kind of students? No. Yeah. It's, I mean, what happens to first years? They get sorted. What are first years before they're sorted? They all are Hogwarts students. They get sorted and they become what? Slytherins, Ravenclaws, Hufflepuffs, Gryffindors. Yes, they're still Hogwarts students. This is like Oxford. Okay? You've got Oxford University, the umbrella organization. Underneath Oxford University, you've got Modlin College, Pembroke College, St. Hilda College, Merton College, whole Corpus Christi College, Christchurch College, about 27 or 30 different colleges that are all part of the University of Oxford. MTSU is kind of the same. You've got Middle Tennessee State University, College of Liberal Arts, College of Business, College of Communication, it's not its name anymore, it's something else, you know, etc. Okay? Yeah, media and entertainment or something like that. Okay? So when it says, while still alive, they did divide their favorites from the throng, it means what the sorting at means is when all those years, when all those students came, Ravenclaw, Gryffindor, Hufflepuff, and Slytherin kind of went among the students and said, you belong with me, you belong with me, you belong with me, and I don't care about any of the rest of you. And then the others, okay, and that's what they did. They took their favorites, that is, Gryffindor picked those that Gryffindor thought would be the bravest. Ravenclaw picked those that she thought would be the smartest. Hufflepuff picked those that she thought would be the hardest workers. And Slytherin took those with most ambition. And who were power hungry, like Slytherin. Okay? Yet how to pick the worthy ones when they were dead and gone? That is, when the four founders, once we die, how do we pick the people that will go in the houses that are named after us? "'Twas Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head." Okay, describe the sorting hat. It's been described in other books. It's old and ripped. Well, how old is it? It's over a thousand years. Okay. Now this, I think, is important because she doesn't bring anything else up about the hat in later novels, and she should. Because what were we told about this hat in the second book? Here he's down there in the Chamber of Secrets. He's finding the basilisk. He's like, help me, somebody, please, if there's a god. And what happens? 
Fox shows up and drops him a hat. And Tom Riddle's like, all right, Dumbledore brings you a songbird and a hat. woo -hoo! Feel better now? Harry puts the hat on his head and does what? Help me. Help me, Obi-Wan Hat Kenobi, you know. <laughs> and what happens? The hat, you know, yeah, drops a sword on him. I was going to use language that was not pretty, but <laughs> drops a sword on his head. Harry takes the hat and the sword back to Dumbledore, and what does Dumbledore tell him in his final debriefing scene? Only a true Gryffindor could have pour, pulled that sword out of the hat. And Harry now looks at the sword, and what does it have in it? Godric Gryffindor. It's Gryffindor's sword. Right? What does Dumbledore mean, only a true Gryffindor could have pulled that sword out of the hat? Does he mean only somebody who's really brave? No, he doesn't. Yes. Only a real Gryffindor, only somebody descended from Gryffindor could have pulled that sword out of the hat. Okay? But he doesn't say anything about the hat, really. But here we're told the hat belonged to God and Gryffindor. Later on, book seven, we're going to be looking for things that belong to founders of the houses. And the hat is not mentioned at all. It's to me, one of the strangest things in all of her writing. So, twas Gryffindor who found the way. He whipped me off his head. The founders put some brains in me so I could choose instead. Does that mean they literally, you know? No. They charmed it in. Or, as we will see later in this, possibly they use. the pencil and take thoughts out of their minds and put them into the hat. So that the hat can then determine, so what kind of thoughts? Well, what does Gryffindor value? Bravery, courage, daring. So it puts those things in the hat. What does Ravenclaw value? Apparently really just cleverness. Doesn't go much beyond that. Hufflepuff, it goes beyond hard work. Those who are fair and just, we're going to be told in the next Sorting Hat song. Okay? Slytherin, it's pretty much ambition and power hungry. Those who will do whatever they need to get what they want out of life. So, the founders put some brains in me so I could choose instead. Now slip me snug about your ears, I've never yet been wrong. I have a look inside your mind and tell where you belong. Harry, that's not the same song as saying when it's sort of us. Ron sings a different one every year. Well, how does Ron know that? <laughs> Ron's been there just as long as Harry. Ron's been for the same sortings as Harry. Ron and Harry weren't there for the second year sorting. Remember? Because they got there late, flying the magical flying car. Maybe his brothers told him. Could be his brothers told him. Louder? Was Harry? No, he got called into the in the third one. Prisoner of Azkaban. Yeah, him and Hermione. Oh, when he get all the time on him, got the time for him. McGonagall pulled Harry into the office. Was that during the sorting though? Yeah. Okay. No, they didn't go back to the police. They sent him to the yeah. I'm just, I'm drawing a complete blank on that. So, okay. So we see the, um, the sorting. We get a bunch of people sorted. And let's see here. Nearly Headless Nick spills the beans, page 181, about there being house elves at Hogwarts. And Hermione's like, what? He's like, well, of course. Who do you think does all the cooking and cleaning? But I've never seen one, says Hermione, page 182. Well, they hardly ever leave the kitchen by day, do they? They come out at night to do a bit of cleaning, see to the fires and so on. I mean, you're not supposed to see them, are you? That's the mark of a good house elf. In other words, it's like magic, Hermione. But, but they get paid. They get holidays, don't they? And, and sick leave and pensions and everything. 
Nearly headless Nick chortled so much that his ruff slipped and its head flopped off, dangling on the inch or so of ghostly skin. Sick leave and pensions? How self don't want sick leave and pensions? Run. Oh, come on, Hermione. You know, because his face is just stuffed full of food. You won't get them sick leave by starving yourself. Slave labor. That's what made this thing. Slave labor. And she goes on for the entire rest of the book like this. Okay? Why? What happens to Spew after this book? Pretty much nothing. It becomes unimportant. I mean, she takes Creature as her project, her, uh, her do-goody thing she's going to say. And Creature, you know, kind of stabs her in the back, almost. So what is Rowling doing there with, with Hermione and the house elves? Because I'm not sure. I used to think I knew, but after she published the last novel 10 years ago, Rowling, in my opinion, has just gone completely bonkers off the deep end. Okay? Um, I knew at the time, that is when she was publishing these, she was left of center. She's no longer just, and I don't care what your politics are, and you shouldn't care what mine are. She's not just left of center. She's, the needle's gone all the way left of center, right? What do I mean by all that? What's Hermione trying to do for the house elves? Free them, civil rights movement for house elves, human slash house elf rights movement for house elves, okay? What must she do to get the house elves to buy into her, what she's selling? That's, I mean, that's what she's talking about. Okay? She's a community organizer for house elves. Okay? So what does a community organizer have to do to the community before the community organizer can organize them? Tell them how horrible their current community is. Yes! That is exactly it. The community organizer has got to get the people he or she wants to organize to realize their lives suck. That they are really horrible. Okay? Hermione has got to do that with the house elves. She has got to teach them what? Let me rephrase that. She has to teach them what about themselves? We're talking Hogwarts here. We're not talking Dobby at the Malfoys. Okay, Dobby at the Malfoys, I don't think anybody would say he's got a good life. Life is really bad for Dobby. All you have to do is listen to Dobby. House elves here at Hogwarts, how bad is it? Do they have to slam their ears in the oven doors? Do they have to stick their heads in the ovens? No, they don't, okay? But she has to make them miserable so that she can then what? Make them unmiserable. She has to miserify them in order to relieve them of their misery. And yet Rowling, for, for some inexplicable reason to me, just drops it. I mean, she literally just drops it. We don't see anything about house elf welfare in book six and seven. Why? Could be because there are bigger fish to fry. You know, when you've got Satan breathing down your tail and wanting to hunt you, that's something you want to take care of first. Okay? Why else? I think after she writes this book and as she's writing the fifth book and the sixth book, I think she realizes or realized, oops. I bit off too much. In other words, the social justice warrior part of her character, okay, she worked for Amnesty International. That, that should answer everything. And Amnesty, um, don't get me wrong, even though I'm right wing, Amnesty International does a lot of great work, okay? But it's, you know, entirely a social justice kind of war for, warrior mentality. We're going to bring peace and light, you know, throughout the world. 
she, she brings that into the novel, and then I think she realized, I can't do this. I, I, I can't make it work within the world of this novel. Because what happens if she does free all the house elves? Wizards have to do their own laundry. I mean, there you go. We're, you know, we're stuck with Henry David Thoreau and Walden. If you know what I'm talking about. Henry David Thoreau wrote a little book called Walden about his time when he went and lived off in the woods. He left Concord, New Hampshire, or Massachusetts, left Concord, which was actually only a couple miles away, when he went off into the woods. And he writes this big, long story about how he went to the woods. Why? Because he wanted to live deliberately. He wanted to suck all the marrow out of life. He wanted to confront nature and really know what it's like to live. And yet, once or twice a week, he took his laundry into town for Mrs. Emerson to wash for him. Yeah, he built his cabin, but he couldn't wash his own damn laundry. This, this is not, you know, living off the earth and being totally self-sufficient, which is the picture he creates of his life while he's living at his little log cabin in the woods, right? So what would happen? Hogwarts is a what? It is a massive castle. It has hundreds of rooms. Student dormitory rooms, classrooms, staff rooms, meeting rooms, and then the staff's living rooms, living quarters, and their offices. You no longer have house elves to do the cleaning. People are going to have to start cleaning. Who's going to cook the meals? Filch. Yeah, Hufflepuffs. Filch. Hufflepuffs. Yeah, Hufflepuffs, because they're the hard workers. You don't want them, because, you know, you're going to get stuff in your food. Okay? A little bit of x lax in the brownies. <laughs> Wouldn't that be funny, you know? It, it would just create too much of a problem for her to be able to resolve. Um, okay, so Dumbledore introduces the Triwizard Tournament. After Moody shows up. Describe Moody's face. It should be battle scarred. And not symmetrical. <laughs> yeah, I shouldn't be like mine, you know, nice and level. One should kind of, you know, be a little bit like that. Scar, part of his nose missing, the other part of his nose bent. Okay. Probably some teeth missing. This guy's been through a lot. And then Dumbledore enters, uh, mentions the Triwizard Tournament. What is the purpose of the Triwizard Tournament? Foster international magical cooperation. What is its equivalent in our world? Yeah. It's the Olympics. Is the Olympics really about fostering international goodwill? Now, most of you, all of you, aren't old enough to remember the good old heady days of the Cold War between the United States and the West and the Soviet Union and the Eastern Bloc country, where we took an awful lot of our aggression out at the Olympics. Okay? So that you'd have those damn East German judges giving, you know, East German gymnasts 8.5, 8.9, 8.8, 8.7, and then an American would come and just kick their you-know-whats, and they'd get 6, 7, 7.2, etc. Okay? It wasn't about international magical or international cooperation at all. So is this? It says it is. Kind of, yeah. So he says, you know, the death toll, but there's not going to be a death toll this time. Why not? Well, everybody has to be 17, but that's not going to stop you from dying. There's going to be safeguards put in place. Dumbledore says, don't worry, nobody will die this year. Okay, that's something Harry doesn't remember. Because we get to the second task, which you probably haven't read yet, but we get to the second task and Harry thinks, oh my God. All these people are going to die. I've got to save them. And he tries to save all of them. 
not realizing, not thinking, well, the time will run out and then they'll just be freed. But we'll leave that alone. All right? So, Harry, Ron, start thinking, man, it'd be cool to enter. How old are they? Yeah, they're not even close to being old enough. Fred and George are 16. They'll be 17 in the spring. They're thinking, we're close enough. We'll sneak past Dumbledore's um, age line. Thank you. So we meet Mad-Eye Moody, chapter 13. Um, we find out, you know, some people have tried to get past the age line and haven't worked. Fred and George do an age spell. They get big, long beards. Doesn't work. Uh, we're introduced to Professor Trelawney, page 199. We've actually seen her once before. Harry has her for divination. And she suggests, you know, Harry's going to die. I mean, we did see her in Prisoner of Azkaban with, you know, the Dark Lord will rise again and such. Pages 202 and 203, we get Rita Skeeter's scoop with the Daily Prophet where she talks about Arnold Weasley. And Malfoy thinks that's pretty funny. Page 204. And there's a picture, Weasley, says Malfoy, flipping the paper over, holding it up. A picture of your parents outside their house, if you could call it a house. Your mother could do with losing a bit of weight, couldn't she? Ron, notice, shaking with fury. Harry comes to his defense. Get stuffed, Malfoy. Come on, Ron. Oh, yeah, you were staying with them this summer, weren't you, Potter? So tell me, is his mother really that porky, or is it just a picture? Harry, again, this is this a, cl a clutch situation where he's quick. He's really fast. You know your mother, Malfoy, that expression she's got, like she's got dung under her nose? Has she always looked like that, or is that just because you were with her? Malfoy's pace, face, pale face, went slightly pink. Don't you insult my mother, Potter. Keep your fat mouth shut then says Harry, turning away. So he now has his back to Malfoy. Bam! Several people screamed. Harry felt something white hot graze the side of his face, plunges his hand into his robes, and then we hear another bang, and, oh, no, you don't, laddie. Harry spins around. There's Moody coming down the marble staircase. Wand out, pointing at a pure white ferret shivering on the stone flagged floor where Malfoy had been standing. Terrified silence, nobody moving, except for, Mus except for Moody. Moody looks at Harry and says, did it get you? Harry, no, missed. Leave it! Harry, leave, not you, him, points at Crab, who's about to pick up the white ferret. Moody starts to limp toward Crab, Goyle, and the ferret which gave a terrified squeak and took off. I don't think so. I don't like people who attack when their opponent's back's turned, said growled Moody as the ferret bounced higher and higher, so he's going, wham, wham, wham. Got a ferret at home, one wham. They're very fragile creatures. Stinking, cowardly, scooby thing to do. The ferret flew through the air, its legs and tail flailing helplessly. Never, bam, do. Bam. Zap. Bam. Again. Bam. Professor Moody. McGon They're both Scotch. You know, Scottish. She comes down. Oh, Professor McGonagall. Bouncing the ferret higher. What, what are you doing? Teaching. Moody, is that a student? Yep. No. We never use transfiguration as a punishment. Surely Professor Dumbledore told you that. He might have mentioned it, yeah, but I thought a good shot not. We give detentions, Moody, or speak to the fender's head of house. Now, remember the line of work Moody's coming from. Okay. What do you think Moody's going to think of detention? Oh, time out. Uh-uh. No. What works in Moody's line of work? Pain. Pain. A great teacher. Okay. So, Moody. Okay. I'll do that then. He looks at Malfoy, who's now back to being Malfoy. Malfoy says something, like my father. Oh, yeah, says Moody. 
Well, I know your father, old boy. Should he say that publicly? If anybody knows that Moody is a former auror, and he says, I know your father. <laughs> I know your father, old boy. You tell him Moody's keeping a close eye on his son. You tell him that for me. You know your head of house will be snake with it. Yes, another old friend. I've been looking forward to a chat with old Snake. And Harry and Ron are sitting there probably going, oh, this would be good. I want to be there, you know. Let's get the invisibility cloak. Ron said, don't talk to me. Said quietly to Harry and Hermione as they sat down at the Griffin table. Why not, says Hermione. Because I want to fix that in my memory forever. Draco Malfoy, the amazing bouncing ferret. Oh, but he could have really hurt Malfoy, says Hermione, it was good, really, that Professor McGonagall... Hermione, you're ruining the best moment of my life. Right? So, we go on. That's our first real introduction to Moody. I mean, yeah, he made the nice dramatic entrance at the feast. So we see this. So what's our immediate impression? Okay. Notice what he said. I don't like people who attack when your back's turned. It's a cowardly, scummy thing to do. It's not what? Honorable. If you're going to fight somebody, how do you fight them? To your face, you know. There's a great scene, and um, if you're familiar with it, I'm kind of a nerd this way. The old one-season series, Firefly. Okay? When... Captain Reynolds. Yeah, it's not Mal. Simon. He's talking with Simon. He's talking with Simon, the young doctor. Okay? And Simon kind of says to him, this is after their, their initial meeting, hour-long episode or so. And Simon's saying, you know, I just kind of feel like I'm going to, you're going to shoot me in the back sometime. Mal sits down and says, son, if I ever kill you, I'll be standing face to face with you, and you'll be armed. I'll never, it'll never be backwards. It'll never be where I'm going to shoot you in the back. Showing his character throughout the series, which again, only 13 episodes long, okay? Um, but it's one of those cult kind of favorites. Showing this guy who is a rogue, who is a renegade, is honorable to the core, all right? So, the unforgivable curses. And they go off to defense against the dark arts. Okay, so let's talk about the defense against the dark arts teachers they've had so far. Quirrell, not so good. Lockhart, even worse. Lupin. Yeah, he's even good. Damn good. <laughs> okay. He's a werewolf, okay? You can't hold that against them. It's like saying, yeah, but he's got blue eyes. It's not his fault. Okay? But what did Lupin teach him? Think of Lupin's first lesson. He has a boggart in the classroom, right? And he teaches him the, the ridiculous charm. What does he have Neville do? He says, think of Professor Snap. I really don't want to think of him. And think of your grandmother. Don't want to think of her either. Because the bogger will come out as either Professor Snape, whom he's afraid of, or my grandmother, who he's also afraid of. He goes, no, no, you misunderstand me. Put your grandmother's clothes on Professor Snape. Now, keep in mind, this is a teacher talking about another teacher. Make Professor Snape be in drag. Well, I mean, he did move. Well, yeah, sure he did. Okay. And this is Lupin's little subtle way of getting back at Snape. So... Neville challenges the boggart. The boggart comes out, and it's dressed as Snape, and then ridiculous. It's Snape in drag. It's Snape as transvestite. That changes the equation quite a bit, so that everybody's laughing. That is no longer a fearsome Snape. That's a pretty good teacher. What does he teach Harry to do? Third year, what? the Patronus charm. The... Expecto Patrona. Hopefully you watch the video because I talk about exactly what all that means because it's pretty important actually. 
So, Lupin was a good teacher. Why is he not the teacher anymore? Because Snape told everybody he was a werewolf. And Dumbledore was like, well, you know, you can't, it's kind of hard to have werewolves around. But, so now we have Mad-Eye Moody. So Moody says, I'm right then. Page 211. I've had a letter from Professor Lupin about this class. Seems you've had a pretty thorough grounding and tackling dark creatures, boggarts, red caps, hinky pinks, grindy lows, kappas, werewolves, etc. Boggarts, grindy lows, kappa, uh, excuse me, werewolves, those are all quote unquote real in Scottish mythology. Red caps and hinky pinks, red caps, hinky pinks, and kappas, I don't think are. Boggarts, grindy lows, you know, werewolves, obviously. He says, but you're behind. Go ahead. Red caps were a classic fairy tale creature. Okay. That was Maybe familiar. not in Scottish. But Wasn't familiar, familiar with that. Okay. That's right. So he says, but you're behind in dealing with curses. So I'm here to bring you up on wizards, what wizards can do to each other. In other words, those are other magical creatures. Do you, do you really need to fear those? Not unless you're out wandering in bogs. Okay. Where granny loads are going to get you. You need to be worried about what? What other people are going to do to you? So I got one year. Ron, what, you're not staying? He goes, you'll be Arthur Weasley's son, eh? Your father got me out of a very tight corner a few days ago. Yeah, staying just the one year. Favor to Dumbledore. So straight into it. Curses. They come in many strengths and forms. Now, according to the Ministry of Magic, I'm supposed to teach you counter curses and leave it at that. I'm not supposed to show you what illegal dark curses look like until you're in the sixth year. You're not supposed to be old enough to deal with it till then. But Professor Dumbledore's got a higher opinion of your nerves. He reckons you can cope. And I say the sooner you know what you're up against, the better. In other words, Dumbledore doesn't think you're not old enough. So... I'm going to give you, he's kind of saying, the full load. You're getting the, the, the whole kit and caboodle of curses. So, how are you supposed to defend yourself against something you've never seen? It's a pretty good question. A wizard is about to put an illegal curse on you, isn't going to tell you what he's about to do. Oh, should I even go there? Wow. I just thought of something related to our crazy modern world. He's not going to do it nice and polite to your face. You need to be prepared. Oh, what the hell. Somebody who wants to kill you with a gun is going to do what? They're not going to go to a place where it says, guns allowed. They're going to go where? Where have all, most of the major, let's say, well, take Las Vegas out of the picture for a moment. Some of the biggest mass killings in the United States have been where? Schools. Movie theaters that have what posted outside? This is a gun-free zone. Gun-free zone means the only person who's going to have a gun there is going to be whom? Obviously. Other than a police officer. Because the guards aren't. Right? Rent-a-cops don't wear guns. Because they're rent-a-cops. They're not real cops. Sorry for any of you who are night guards here. Don't carry weapons. Say that again? Somebody trying to break the law. Okay. Somebody who is not following the law, who doesn't care about the law. The Virginia Tech shooting several years ago. Virginia Tech was a no-carry school. Okay. And again, I don't care what your politics are. I don't carry. If I did, I would not be allowed to tell you that. I would be fired for telling you if I had a concealed weapon permit and carried on campus, even though MTSU and all the Tennessee schools are now uh, allowed to do that. But the point is, what is Moody saying here? Somebody who's going to curse you, let's use our world language, somebody who's going to come up and be a terrorist to you isn't going to come up and say, pardon me, I'm going to terrorize you now. They're not going to show manners and courtesy about it, okay? They're not going to wait for a wand-free zone. <laughs> so, 
Do any of you know which curses are most heavily punished? Notice he doesn't start with misdemeanors. <laughs> he goes straight to capital punishment kind of crimes. Several hands. Ron. Uh, imperious or something? Ah, yes. Your father would know that one. Gave the ministry a lot of trouble at one time. And he pulls out a jar out of a desk drawer. It's got three big spiders in it. Pulls one spider out. Notice Ron backs up. Why? All spider issue. Pulls one out. So he has it in his hand and goes, Imperial. The spider leaps from his hand on a fine thread of silk. Starts to swing back and forth like on a trapeze. Then he puts it on the desk and it starts to cartwheel and dance. Everybody laughs. Think it's funny, do you? You'd like it, would you, if I did it to you? Total control. I can make it jump out of the window, drown itself, throw itself down one of your throats. He says, years back, a lot of witches and wizards were controlled by the imperious curse. Job for the ministry, figuring out who really was and who merely said they were. He says it can be taught, and I'll be teaching you how, but what's it take? Strength of character to throw off the imperious curse. And not everyone's got it. Better avoid being hit with it if you can. Constant vigilance. Now, this book came out in 2000. In 2005, when I flew to London to teach my Harry Potter course, um, the morning of July 7th, we flew over July 8th. The morning of July 7th, I was awakened by a phone call at 6.30. It was the MTSU study abroad coordinator who said, don't stop, plan on going. And I'm like, what? I literally woke up with the phone. Aren't you awake? No. Turn on the news. Turn on the news. And it was talking about the British bombings of the tube system. Plans are still to go. I got to London next day. She'd seen a London I'd never seen before. I'd been to London, I don't know, half a dozen times before then. You know, we got to Heathrow Airport, and, you know, you have aisles like this, sometime this way. Aisles like this, and there are London cops walking four abreast down those aisles with semi-automatics. Fingers on the trigger guard. I mean, these guys were not there to play. Okay? You go into central London, walk down... Oxford Street, which is like Fifth Avenue in New York, main shopping thoroughfare. And there'd be four cops walking right beside each other so that, you know, people up ahead of them would just do this. You would turn and look up at the tops of buildings, and there would be snipers. I mean, that first weekend, there were snipers at Piccadilly Circus. There were snipers at Regent Street. There were snipers on the mall. There were snipers outside Buckingham Palace. Right? And they don't normally have snipers. Anyway, you never see guns. I mean, most cops that would have with them is the billy stick. This time, every cop was armed. Okay? And I remember once getting on the tube, I think it was that weekend, and having above one of the windows where they normally have advertisements, Constant vigilance. And I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe this is happening. It's like I'm living a Harry Potter novel. Constant vigilance. If you see something, say something. Okay? Constant vigilance, he warns. He goes, okay. Another? Hermione's hands in the air. So is Neville's. Neville's sitting up close. Neville. Uh, Cruciatus Curse? Your name's Longbottom. Needs to be a bit bigger then. So he pulls the spider out. Engorgio! And the spider swells. Now larger than a tarantula. How big is a tarantula? The size of your hand. Yeah. Big one's about the size of my hand. Sometimes, some are about the size of this, right? When I was a stupid sophomore, no, junior, sophomore. In high school one day after, I don't remember what it was, track practice or something, I went to my uh, biology 
classroom, I didn't have a shirt on and because somebody had a pet tarantula in there. And I did something I will never, ever do again, and I let that person put that tarantula on my back. Just imagine a spider, because you can feel each foot. And if you know how a spider moves, the, the feet don't move, you know, symmetrically, or whatever the turn is. It's like one here, then one here, and one here, and one here, and one here. And it just started crawling all over, and I'm like, get it off. Get it off now. Cause it was, yeah, it was about the size of my hand. It was a, it was a big size. Okay? So, he does that. Ron backs up even more. And what does he do? Crucio. At once, the spider's legs bent in upon its body. It rolled over began to twitch horribly, rocking from side to side. No sound came, but Harry was sure that if it could have given voice, it would have been screaming. Hermione says, stop. Why? Because she's not looking at the spider. She's looking at Neville. And Neville, as his hands were told, clenched upon the desk in front of him, and his knuckles were white. His eyes wide and horrified. Okay? So he stops. Reducio puts the spider back in the jar. So now two spiders have gotten curses. Pain. You don't need thumb screws or knives to torture someone if you can perform the Cruciacus curse. That one was very popular once, too. Right. Anyone know any others? Harry looks around. They're all wondering what's going to happen next. Hermione, you about a cadaver? <laughs> yes, the last of the worst, the killing curse. And as though the spider knows what's coming, it's, you know, the last one, it's trying to get away. It's like the other two are marked, they're going, thank God, you know, this one's not us, this is, Fred's dying now. Avada Kedavra. He just kills it. We're told there is a flash of. Oh, um, there is a flash of blinding green light on a rushing sound, as though a vast invisible something was soaring through the air. What is that vast invisible something? Is it death coming and taking the spider? Or is it life fleeing? never clear. Several of the students stifled cries. It's just a freaking spider. Ron had thrown himself backward, almost toppled off his seat. Moody sweeps the spider off onto the floor. Not nice. Not pleasant. And there's no counterparts. There's no blocking it. Only one known person has ever survived it. And he points at Harry. Harry's like, oh great, here we go again. Yeah, that's me. He felt his face redden as Moody's eyes, both of them, looked into his own. So that was how his parents died. Exactly like that spider. Unblemished, unmarked too. Had they simply seen the flash of green light and heard the rush of speeding death? Ah, so is that what that was? That's what Harry interprets that rushing sound as. Before life was wiped from their bodies, he'd been picturing his parents' deaths over and over again for three years now, ever since he'd found out they'd been murdered. And what's been happening to him, or excuse me, what happened to him throughout the third book? Every time he sees the Dementor, he goes farther and farther and farther back in his memory. No, not Harry. No, take me. Run, Lily. I'll stop him. How Voldemort had killed Harry's father first. How James Potter had tried to hold him off while he shouted at his wife to take Harry and run. How she had begged him to kill her instead. Refused to shut, stop shielding her son. Moody's speaking while Harry's thinking all this. Avada Kedavra is a curse that needs a powerful bit of magic behind it. You can get all your wands out now and point them at me. I'm not going to get so much as a nosebleed. Now, if there's no counter curse, why am I showing you? Because you've got to know. 
Why? So that you know how you're going to die when somebody stands up and goes, of a if you saw the Harry Potter and the Chamber of Secrets film, what does Malfoy at the very end, when he whips out his wand out of his walking stick, and uh, Winky Blinky and uh, Dobby stops him, what does Malfoy start to say? Um, he starts doing a vodka Kedavra when Dobby stops him. Okay? So he says again, constant vigilance. Those three curses, Avada Kedavra, Imperius Cruciatus, <clears throat> are known as the unforgivable curses. The use of any one of them on a fellow human being is enough to earn a life sentence in Azkaban. That's what you're up against. Notice, life sentence, not kiss of death. <laughs> not Dementor's kiss. That's what I've got to teach you to fight. You need preparing. You need arming. Most of all, you need to practice constant, never-ceasing vigilance. Okay? So they leave class and they're like, Phew. man, that was intense. Not quite like capturing Cornish pixies in the first year. Okay? So Moody invites Neville up to his office to show him a book. Kind of sketchy, but I won't go there. Um, Let's see. Uh, Harry and Ron go off to divination. Hermione starts spew. And page 226, end of that chapter. <laughs> Harry finally gets a letter back from Sirius. It's been months. Okay. I'm flying north immediately. This news about your scar is the latest in a series of strange rumors that have reached me here. If it hurts again, go straight to Dumbledore. They're saying he's got Mad-Eye out of retirement, which means he's reading the signs, even if no one else is. Well, who else do we know reads signs? First book, for Forbidden Forest, Centaurs. The Centaurs read the signs. They read the planets. Okay? Harry's thinking, man, if Sirius comes back and he gets caught, it'll be my fault. What lesson still hasn't sunk in from the previous year? He and Dumbledore have their debriefing, their conversation at the end of Prisoner of Azkaban. And they talk about Peter Pettigrew and Harry saving his life. And Harry says, but according to the prophecy that Trelawney said, you know, Voldemort's servant, who's been chained for 12 years, is going to go back to Voldemort, and he will rise to power. That's going to be my fault. And Dumbledore's, no, Harry. Why isn't it Harry's fault? What, what power is Harry taking to himself there? Or what is he denying Peter Pettigrew? It's the choice. He's taking away, Peter, almost as if he's doing the Imperius curse. Peter Pettigrew has the choice. He can run back to Voldemort, yes, he can. Or he can go somewhere else and live his life as a rat. <laughs> and nobody will ever know. Okay? What does Dumbledore say there about choices and such at the end of book three? He says we can never know the consequences, all the consequences of our actions. But he does say, you've now created a bond between yourself and Peter Pettigrew. That's not something Voldemort's necessarily going to like. And yet we open up this book, and there's Peter Pettigrew with Voldemort. Okay. We'll see what comes of it. So, Harry writes it back, says... I just imagine my scar hurting. You don't need to come up here. Just go. Stay away. So, another class with Moody. He says, I'm going to teach you how to put off the Imperius curse. Page 230. So I have to put you under it. Hermione. But professor, you said it's illegal, professor. 
You, you said to use it against another human was, Dumbledore wants you taught what it feels like. If you'd rather learn the hard way when someone's putting it on you so they can control you completely, fine by me. You're excused. Well, off you go. And Hermione's like, hell no, man. I'm going to watch this. this is... <laughs> so he starts. Puts Dean Thomas. He hops three times around the world, around the room, singing the national anthem. Lavender Brown imitates a squirrel. Neville performs a series of quite astonishing gymnastics. Gymnastics. He wouldn't normally be able to. Potter, you next. Harry goes forward. Imperial, notice what we're told. It's the most wonderful feeling. Harry felt a floating sensation as every thought and worry in his head was wiped gently away leaving nothing but a vague and traceable happiness. Why? Louder? Sounds like tripping. Yeah. Okay, it's like he's tripping. Meaning what, though? Like in a state of You no longer have responsibility. Bingo. You no longer have any responsibility. You no longer feel any duty. Why? What happens to the I? It's gone. Right? If imperial means you are put under somebody else's power, under somebody else's will, then you don't have a will anymore. There's no me to say, I want, I need, I desire, I lack. And then he hears Mad Eye Moody's voice. Jump onto the desk. Jump onto the desk. He bends his knees. But then another little voice says, uh, why? Another voice had woken in the back of his brain. Stupid thing to do, really. Jumping on the desk. Jump onto the desk. No, I don't think I will, thanks, said the other voice a little more firmly. No, I really don't want to. Jump now. The next thing Harry felt was considerable pain. He had both jumped and tried not to jump. And so he smacks his shins right into the front of the desk. Now well, that's more like it, growls Moody. Look at that, you lot. Potter fought. Did Dean Thomas, did Lavender, did Neville? None of them did. He fought it, and he damn near beat it. We'll try that again, Potter. The rest of you pay attention. Watch his eyes, that's where you see it. Very good, Potter, very good indeed. They'll have trouble. Controlling you. He does that on Harry four more times. And the last time, what happens? Harry completely repels it. Okay? Why? What does it take, he said in their first lesson, to put off the Imperial skirts? Real strength of character. So what does that mean? What is real strength of character? What is character? How do you get character? Why can't Neville do it? Why can't Dean Thomas do it? Why can't Lavender Brown do it? Well, let's leave Neville and Dean Thomas. Let's pick on Lavender. Because <clears throat> she's a pretty flighty airhead all throughout the books. Why can Harry, but not Lavender? What does Harry have in his life that Lavender doesn't? As far as we know. A purpose. Okay, a purpose. Well, he's seen a lot of shit to be like 15, 14. He's had to deal with a lot. All right? Look at Harry growing up with, no, with, with Dudley. What's life been like for Harry? He's been Dudley's punching bag almost all his life. And then he gets to school, and everybody expects one of him. What did um, Ollivander say when Harry got his wand? We must expect great things from you, Mr. Potter. He's like, oh, great. That's just here. Put another thousand pounds on this shoulder because I'm feeling a little light there. Okay. So how do you get strength of character? Overcome adversity. Would Dudley, if Dudley were magical, would Dudley be able to do this? 
No. <laughs> Why not? Dudley's never overcome adversity. Will Malfoy? No. He's a mama's boy. He gets everything he wants. When has Harry gotten what he wanted? Ever. <laughs> he got to go to Hogwarts finally. But he didn't want to go to Hogwarts, though. He didn't know anything about Hogwarts. He got his firebolt, and he failed at it. He got the firebolt. What did it take to get the firebolt? Fall off a balloon. What did it take to get, you know, on the Quidditch team in the first place? Ability. What adversity did he overcome there? It wasn't his own personal adversity. It was Neville's. He did what? He put himself into adversity to defend somebody else. He put himself into danger to defend Neville. Okay. And in doing so, he shows, you know, he's got some natural skills, etc. Harry throughout has always got to overcome. At, at one point, you know, he's going to talk to Ron and Hermione. I think it's in book five. And they're going to say, Harry, you know, this stuff always happens. He's like, I don't go looking for it. Book one. Did he go looking for it? To some extent. Did a lot of it just happen to him? Uh, yeah. Book two. Did he really want that road bludger to break his arm? No, getting a broken arm is pretty painful. Did he really want to lose his bones entirely? No, not really. Did he want his Nimbus 2000 to get beaten into toothpicks by the Whomping Willow? No. Okay. Every time. Okay. He's overcoming one trouble after another. None of these others have. That's why Lupin says in the third book, Harry, you have things in your past. None of these others do. How about Lily, take Harry, run, I'll hold him off. He can remember that now. That's, that, that's a pretty adverse situation to have to hear. To hear your mother die. To hear her scream, no, not Harry, please. You know, and then just, you know, as the record, as the needle on the record just kind of goes, Because he'll never hear that voice again. All right? So, we hear more about the Triwizard Tournament. Harry gets another letter from Sirius. Nice try. I'm still coming. And we meet the new... The students from the other two schools and their headmasters. And headmaster and headmistress. Igor Karkaroff and Madame Maxine. What's the defining characteristic of Madame Maxine? She is big. She is a big woman. This is a large woman. I don't mean large. I mean... She's taller than Hagrid. Yeah. How tall is Hagrid? Eight foot. His hands, we're told, are the size of dustbin lids. Trash can lids. Trash can, you know. 20 inches or so in diameter. That's how big the span of his hand is. So that's about six inches. That's about 12 to 15. So Hagrid's hands are big, <laughs> in other words. And Madame Maxime is taller, larger than Hagrid. So we get the Goblet of Fire. And I'm going to skip a bunch. Dumbledore talks about the age line. He says, it's kind of the rules, page 256. Wish to impress upon any of you wishing to compete that this tournament is not to be entered into lightly. Once a champion has been selected by the Goblet of Fire, he or she is obliged to see the tournament through to the end. Placing of your name in the Goblet constitutes a binding magical contract. There can be no notice it's not... If you put your name in, it's the placing of your name. The agency behind 
person doing the placing never specified. There can be no change of heart once you have become a champion. Please be very sure, therefore, that you're wholeheartedly prepared to play before you drop your name into the goblet. To notice that. To play. This will be fun, children. Okay. So, Fred thinks he knows the way to get around it, age line and such. So we're going to skip a bunch. Hermione talks to Ron about spew, page 265. Miss Hagrid refuses to join. And he says, it will be doing them an unkindness, Hermione. It's in their nature to look after humans. That's what they like, see? You've been making them unhappy to take away their work and insulting them if you tried to pay for them. But Harry said Dobby free, and he was over the moon about it. And we heard he's asking for wages now. Yeah, well, you get weirdos in every breed. I'm not saying there isn't odd elf who take freedom, but you'll never persuade him to do it. All right? So, we get the actual event of the names coming out of the Goblet of Fire. First one, page 269. Champion for Durmstrang. Like it's, you know, ever in doubt. Victor Crumb, Ron's, you know, bromance crush. No surprise there, sells, uh, yells Ron. Champion for Beaubaton, Fleur Delacour. Fleur, flower, Delacour of the heart. Oh, isn't that pretty? Right? Ron, here he says, Ron, it's her. They saw her wear Quidditch World Cup. Okay, she was one of the Vila out there. Okay, Hermione says, "Look, look, they're all disappointed. All the other Bobaton are not happy that Fleur is the one chosen." Okay, Hogwarts champion Cedric Diggory. You know, which a lot of people are like. Oh, please, no. Why not? Especially Ron and other males. Yeah, he's. He's a model, essentially. He's perfect, in other words. Good grades, smart, Ravenclaw, okay? Handsome, athletic, Quidditch team captain for his team. He's got everything going for him. And then another name gets spat out. Harry Potter. Harry sat there, aware that every head, page 272, in the Great Hall had turned to look at him. He was stunned. He felt numb. He was surely dreaming. He had not heard correctly. No applause. There was a buzzing as though of angry bees. McGonagall gets to her feet, sweeps past Ludo Bagman and Karkaroff, talks to Dumbledore. Harry looks at Ron and Hermione. They put my name in. You know I did. They just look at him with a blank stare. She calls, or Dumbledore says, Harry, come on. He goes up. Okay. How is he treated by Fleur? Like a servant or a little kid. What is it? Page 274, she says. Do they want us back in the hall? Little Bagman comes in. Extraordinary. May I introduce the fourth Triwizard Champion? Uh, maybe they should change the name to the Quad Wizard Champion? Victor Crumb straightens up. Cedric looks nonplus. Nonplus means what? No, Sandra just says, hmm, nothing, no register at all. Oh, very funny joke, Mr. Bagman, Fleur says. She says, no, his name just came out. But evidently there has been a mistake. He cannot compete. He is too young. He is only 14. Bagman says, well, you know, age line was only a new restriction as of this year, but his name came out. He has to compete. Dumbledore comes in, followed by Crouch, Karkaroff, Madame Maxime, McGonagall, Snape. Okay. And so the headmasters, Bagman, Crouch, start to debate. Snape, notice, jumps in. Well, you know, area does break a lot of rules. I, Dumbledore, it's enough, Severus. Did you put your name into the Goblet of Fire, Harry? No. Did you ask an older student to put your name into the Goblet of Fire? No. 
Ah, uh, but of course he is lying, says Madame Mexier. McGonagall, he could not have crossed the age line. I'm sure we all agreed on that. Dumbledore must have made a mistake with the Dumbledore. It's possible. McGonagall, Dumbledore, you know, I'm going to throw this in. Damn well you did not make a mistake. Notice who's coming to Dumbledore's defense. She's defending his honor. He didn't make a mistake. Okay. So, Crouch says, you have to follow the rules. Rules state clearly, those who, people whose names come out, they're bound in the tournament. So Carcross says, then let's do it over again. I want another, I want to put another name in. He can. Once the Goblet of Fire spits out the names, it goes dead, it goes dormant, it doesn't work until the next Triwizard Tournament. Okay? So what does Moody say, finally? He says somebody else is supposed to put Harry's name in, and they must have done that for a reason. They must have hoped Harry would get killed in this. Page 278 at the bottom. If anyone's got reason to complain, it's Potter. The funny thing, I don't hear him saying a word. Why should he complain, says Fleur. He has the chance to compete, hasn't he? We've all been opting, hoping to be chosen for weeks and weeks. The honor for our school is a thousand gallons. This is a chance many would die for it. Maybe someone's hoping Potter is going to die for it. And they all go... We all know Professor Moody considers the morning wasted if he hasn't discovered six plots to murder him before lunchtime, says Karkaroff. Moody, imagining things, am I? Seeing things. Skilled witch or wizard who put the boy's name. Evidence? Because the hoodwink a very powerful magical object, it would have needed an exceptionally strong confundus charm to bamboozle that goblet to forgetting that only three schools compete. So notice what Moody has just said. Somebody put a charm on the goblet to confuse it. Okay? Why? He's thinking like an aura. He thinks, what would an enemy do? In order to defeat an enemy, what should you do? You should think like him. You should know your enemy. Right? Karkaroff, you seem to have given the, uh, you seem to have given this a great deal of thought, Moody. Moody, there are those who turn innocent occasions to their advantage. It's my job to think the way dark wizards do Karkaroff, as you ought to remember. And Dumbledore's like, Alistair, down boy, <laughs> heal. Revealing too much there. If it were just the teachers, they'd be one thing, but they're students present, right? So, Harry Thin, he goes up to the common room. Gryffindor is throwing a caker, man. I mean, this is the biggest party they've ever had. Everybody leaves but Harry and Ron, page 286. Ron says, so, congratulations. What do you mean, congratulations? Definitely something wrong with the way Ron was smiling. More like a grimace. Well, no one else got across the age line. Not even Fred and George. What'd you use? Invisibility cloak? Wouldn't have worked. No, oh, okay. Because, you know, I thought you might have told me. Because it would have covered both of us. But you found another way, huh? Listen, I told you. I didn't put my name in that goblet. Someone else must have. Well, why would they do that? I don't know. Kill me? It's okay. You can tell me the truth, Ron said. If you don't want anyone else to know, fine. But, you know, a thousand gallons of prize money. And you don't have to do end of year tests either. <coughs> Ron's saying, you got it made. This year is just not going to be parties for you. Harry, I didn't put my name in that goblet. Yeah, okay, only you said this morning you'd have done it last night. No one would have seen you. I'm not stupid, you know. Doing a really good impression of it. Yeah. You want to go to bed, Harry? Expect you'll need to be up early tomorrow for a photo call or something. Closes his curtains and they go to bed. Next morning is weighing of the wands. Harry writes a letter to Sirius. He told me to keep my nose clean and out of trouble. Oops. 
right? Um, let's see here. Skip a bit. Hagrid says he believes Harry. And Malfoy comes out with his support De Cedric Diggory buttons, the real Hogwarts champion. You push on the button and it turns three Potter stinks. Okay. And we see Malfoy again try to curse Harry. Pages 298 and 99. And he uses Dens Algeo. Dens, like when you see a dentist, Algeo from the Latin, which means to increase, to grow, to enlarge. And what does he do? He hits Hermione. We're told. It wasn't a pretty sight, page 299, towards the middle. Hermione's front teeth, already larger than average. So what are we telling us? What is the narrator telling us? Yeah, she's buck too. She's already Bugs Bunny. Okay. Um, Emma Watson, poorly cast. Hermione is not supposed to be cute. She's got wild, frizzy, bushy hair and... Big front teeth, okay? not Emma Watson, in other words. And so Snape comes in. He looks at Harry and Malfoy, explain, Potter attacked me, sir. We attacked each other at the same time. And he hit Goyle, look. Hospital wing Goyle. Malfoy got Hermione, says Ron. Look. And she shows Snape her teeth, which were already grown down past her collar. Yeah, I mean, so these suckers are, you know, a good four inches long now, at least. Snape, I see no difference. Oh, <laughs> oh that's low. I mean, even for Snape, that's low. And Hermione runs off to the hospital. What does she have done while she sees Madame Pomfrey in the hospital wing? She okay. runs them down past her. She has, she has them shrunk down past where they were before. It's like, you know, Aunt March saying, a little bit more, a little bit more. Hermione looks in the mirror, a little bit more, a little bit more, a little, little bit. That's perfect. Okay? We only find that out later. Um, so here he goes off to the wand, Wayne, and he meets Rita Skeeter, page 304. She corners him in a broom closet, tries out her quill, her quick quotes quill, Harry looks down when Rita Skeeter says, Testing, my name is Rita Skeeter, Daily Prophet reporter. And the quill writes, Attractive blonde Rita Skeeter, 43, whose savage quill has punctured many flated reputations. Lovely. In other words, it's working perfectly. Notice, did it say, did it write what she said? No. It wrote what she intended. In other words, she thinks of herself as attractive blonde, Ray Skeeter, 43. You know. So, Harry says, er, when she asks him the question, so Harry, what made you decide to enter the Triwizard Tournament? Er, and it writes, an ugly scar, souvenir of a tragic past, disfigures the otherwise charming face of Harry Potter, whose eyes, ignore the quill, Harry, it's going to keep writing whatever she wants it to say. Okay? Dumbledore comes and rescues Harry. He goes in for his weighing of the wand with Mr. Ollivander. And he gets another letter later that evening from Sirius, page 312. By the way, let me back up for just a moment because this will be important later on. In the weighing of the wands... Fleur goes first, and we find out her wand is rosewood and a hair from the head of a villa. She says, one of her grandmothers, Ollivander. Okay, yeah. Kind of temperamental. All right. Cedric Diggory is next. His is 12 and a quarter inches with unicorn hair in it. Cedric Crumbs. Uh, excuse me, Victor Crumb comes up, 
We're told it's a Gregor Gregorovich creation. It is hornbeam and heart string, 10 and a quarter inches, very rigid. And then we have Harry's. And Ollivander says, ah, oh, yes, 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 how well I remember. Okay. Then we get the letter. Harry, I can't say everything I would like to in a letter. It's too risky in case the owl is intercepted. We need to talk face to face. Can you ensure that you're alone by the fire in Gryffindor Tower at 1 o'clock in the morning on the 22nd of November? I know better than anyone that you can look after yourself. How does he know that? Because Harry saved his life. Harry saved Harry's life. Harry saved Hermione's life. Harry saved Snape's life. Harry saved Ron's life. Okay? When he took on a hundred Dementors across the lake, and while you're around Dumbledore and Moody, I don't think anyone will be able to hurt you. However, someone seems to be having a good try. Entering you in that tournament would have been very risky, especially right under Dumbledore's nose. So, evening of the 22nd. Next chapter, the Hungarian horn tale. The Daily Prophet comes out, and we read about Harry. All right. I'm going to skip a bit. Um, actually, let's just stop there. We will pick up somewhere around 322 on 2 weeks. No class next Tuesday night. It's fall break. And we will finish this. So expect another quiz. Second half of the book.